Okay. Hello, my name is Kelsey Zelma Herx, you can call me Zelma, and this is week three of my Shakespeare channel. So if you're here, you are either lost or you have a great and profound love for this play that no one ever does and you are just starving for content on it. That's right, I'm doing Cymbeline. Now you may be thinking, I have literally never heard of this play ever in my entire life. How come more people don't do it? The short answer for that is it's hard. In its favor, it has some really great characters. Imogen is a wonderful heroine. There are some neat moments, some really nice speeches, but what is it? Is it a history? Is it a comedy? Is it a tragedy? Is it a tragic comedy? A romance? I kind of love this bonkers ass play, but as written, it really does not set you up for success. It's a lot of clumsy exposition, there's a boatload of characters, the plot barely hangs together, and if you've ever had that frustrating moment in a TV show or a play or something where you're like, oh, all of this would have been solved if everyone just got together in a room and told each other what they know. Well, Cymbeline will help you understand why writers never do this. The writing in general is also not Shakespeare's most shining. I mean, it's still Shakespeare, so it's still really beautiful. There are a couple nice turns of phrases here, some nice speeches, but nothing iconic to put on the poster. I have seen three different productions of Cymbeline, two of which I think worked really, really effectively, and the two that worked shared this sort of meta-theatrical stylistic choice. We are actors, and we are telling you and each other a story right now, so it makes all the, frankly, silly story choices seem like they're coming out of the actors rather than the actors trying to decipher this complex story that's already set in stone. And I think that might actually be the key to making a solid production of Cymbeline. There's a lot more than the usual amount of fourth wall breakage, a lot of park and bark exposition, and so it just all kind of hangs together a little bit more coherently and a little bit more stylistically coherently if we all just agree that we're telling each other a story, that we're just playing pretend together. And those two productions that I enjoyed, by the way, were the Public Theater's production in 2015, directed by... I forgot to look it up, but it'll be showing up here. And the Actors Shakespeare Project in Boston in 2011, directed by Doug Lockwood. All right, let's get this thing started. Cymbeline is the king of England, sort of. He is in charge of Britain, but it's still technically in the Roman Empire. Cymbeline is sort of theatrically a weird stepbrother to King Lear as a play, because King Lear features the dissolution of Britain as Scotland, Wales, and England, whereas Cymbeline features its formation, with Wales in particular taking a central role. Cymbeline had three kids. The two boys were kidnapped 20 years ago, leaving him with just one daughter, Imogen. Since he doesn't have a proper heir anymore, he was hoping that Imogen would marry someone that could be king, thus securing his bloodline. And Cymbeline's new wife, amazing, scenery-chewing, stereotypical evil stepmother, very fairy tale. I love her. <laughs> she was hoping that Imogen would marry her son from a previous marriage, Cloten, thus securing her bloodline to the throne. Now I say was because Imogen had other plans and went ahead and married a poor but worthy gentleman named Posthumus Leonidas. So, uh, Posthumus is banished. How do we know all this? Two unnamed gentlemen explain it to each other in the opening scene. Billy, my dude, why are you doing this to me? You have had some clumsy exposition in the past, but this. The first scene with actual characters features Imogen saying a tearful goodbye to her beloved banished Posthumus. She tells him to forget her and to remarry once he goes to Italy, but he tells her he'll be loyal. The two exchange a ring and a bracelet, and Posthumus also leaves with her a serving man, Pisanio. He kind of lurks around in the background a lot, but uh, he's important later. Cymbeline, the king, comes in and is like, hey, what the fuck is this? I thought I banished you. And Posthumus is like, I'm out, I'm out, okay? I'm out. Jeez. And he exits. And Cymbeline proceeds to just tear into Imogen, who pushes back. Like, she is not sorry that she followed her heart, and she is not going to pretend in order to get into the king's good graces. The wicked stepmother is also floating around being sinister throughout these earlier scenes. Next up, we meet Cloten, the wicked stepmother's son, and the dude Cymbeline wanted Imogen to marry. He apparently got into a fight with Posthumus offstage. It sounds like Posthumus just laughed him off. 
off, but Cloten is a huge narcissistic weenie who's convinced that he just pummeled Posthumus nearly to death. Two courtiers listen to him talk about it, blowing smoke up his ass to his face and roasting him to the audience. Now, before I get to where Posthumus is at, I need to explain Rome as a location does double duty in this play. It is both ancient Rome with the Roman Empire, Augustus Caesar, all that stuff. And it is the Rome of Shakespeare's day. So the Renaissance, cosmopolitan intellectuals, untrustworthy Italians, that's the Italy. Posthumus finds himself in. Posthumus seems to be doing all right. He's he's fallen in with a multicultural group of bros. Now I've said in a previous video uh, that I generally have no idea what straight people are up to. That is still true, but um, I do imagine that this is probably exactly what straight men still talk about to this day. Posthumus and his buddies are all just talking about which country's women are hottest. <laughs> And they're just like really going in on this debate. Posthumus, who apparently has not shot up about how hot his wife is since he arrived, he doubles down that his wife is the hottest and the most virtuous babe in all the lands. Now his buddy, Yakimo, he bets Posthumus that he can seduce Imogen. And Posthumus is so confident that he cannot that he takes the bet, offering the diamond heirloom ring that Imogen gave him if Playboy Yakimo manages it. Yakimo is so confident that he can seduce her, that he offers 10,000 ducats if he loses. Back to Britain. We see the wicked stepmother queen buying what she thinks is a slow moving poison from a doctor. The doctor has one of the greatest asides, I think, in all of Shakespeare. I do not like her and tells the audience that he in fact gave the queen a sleeping draught rather than a poison. The queen employs some manipulation to get the poison into the hands of the servant Pisanio. Remember the, the servant that Posthumus left to Imogen to watch over her? Evil queen tells him that it is a rare, potent medicine that'll cure you from anything. Giacomo arrives in Britain bearing news of Posthumus. Imogen, who is just starving for any sort of contact from him, welcomes Playboy Giacomo and is immediately trusting up him. I live right near a firehouse. Helps me feel at home now that I'm not in New York City anymore. Anyway, she welcomes him and is immediately trusting of him. Giacomo tells her that Posthumus is having a grand old time in Rome. He has fallen in with some very spicy ladies and... Spicy ladies? <laughs> And uh, he is not thinking about her at all. Imogen is, of course, devastated by this news because she has been keeping true and not responding to her stepbrother's advances. Yakimo says that she should get her revenge by having sex with him. Why are men like this? She rightfully tells him to fuck off and he's like, I'm, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Unless, no, I'm kidding. And then he's like, oh, another thing, uh, Posthumus and a group of the guys all got together and put a massive trunk together of, of treasure and uh, a gift to give to the emperor. And since you live in a fortified castle, would you mind keeping it safe overnight before I leave tomorrow? Imogen thinks that this is not suspicious in any way and agrees. That night, the trunk is brought into Imogen's bedroom. She goes to sleep and Yakimo emerges from the trunk. He steals the bracelet that Posthumus gave her, kisses her in her sleep and takes a good look at her naked form. Uh, it is gross and creepy. Outside of her room, Weenie Prince Cloten is singing some obnoxious song to serenade her in the hopes that she will get over her banished husband and fall in love with him, I guess. Cymbeline and the evil stepmother are like, you're doing great, kiddo. And then Cymbeline is pulled away by a visitor from Rome. Oh, the trunk is taken out at some point. Cloten and Imogen have a scene where she is like, I literally hate you so much. Kindly f off. Back in Italy, Giacomo rolls in and announces that he has won the wager and has successfully cucked Posthumus. To Posthumus' credit, he doesn't believe it right away, unlike some other Shakespearean heroes I could name. Giacomo describes Imogen's bedchamber and shows that he now has the bracelet that Posthumus gave her, and Posthumus is like, ah, you could have heard it described, you could have paid off a maid to steal it for you, and then Giacomo pulls out the big guns and tells everyone about the birthmark he saw under 
where Imogen's left breast, and that he would only know if he had seen it himself. And between his wife cheating on him and his buddy being a creepy perv who watches women sleeping, I guess Posthumus finds it easier to believe that his wife cheated on him. Yakima just wants to win, he doesn't really care if he's ruining anyone's life, Posthumus' life is left in a shambles, and uh, but uh, but Yakima wins the bet! Haha! <laughs> I can just see Yakimo's Am I the Asshole post. Next we see King Cymbeline in a meeting with a Roman dignitary visiting on behalf of Augustus Caesar. Augustus is asking for tribute from Britain. Cymbeline refuses and the dignitary is like, oh, uh, okay, I guess we're at war now? And Cymbeline's like, guess so. You should stay for dinner before you leave. Meanwhile, Postumus has instructed servant Pisanio. Uh, remember that guy? The servant that he... Yeah, you remember. He has instructed the servant Pisanio to lead Imogen to Milford Haven in Wales under the pretense that he will be there and he and Imogen will be reunited. Imogen is hyped to see her husband. Next, we are in Wales and we meet an old mountain man, Belarius, and his two strapping mountain lads. They've been living off the land and sleeping in a cave in the wilds of Wales for the last 20 years. They're hale and hearty men of nature, untouched by the viciousness of society. Honestly, the Duke from As You Like It could never. The Duke from As You Like It wishes he could. Mountain Man Bellarius turns to the audience and tells us that he was banished by King Cymbeline 20 years ago under false pretenses, and he was so angry about it that he kidnapped King Cymbeline's two toddler sons. That's right, those strapping lads are a pair of princes, and Mountain Man Bellarius is starting to feel a little guilty about keeping them for so long, but also he loves them like he's their own. It's all very emotionally complicated at this point. So Imogen and the servant Pisanio arrive in Wales and surprise, turns out that Posthumus is not meeting them, but rather has instructed Pisanio to murder her as punishment for, he thinks, cheating on him. Great job, Yakimo. Jokes aside, jokes have left the building for the time being. Uh, I would be remiss to get to this part without mentioning that women are disproportionately likely to die by uh, of intimate partners and ex-partners. I've included some links and studies in the description and I highly recommend further reading. This might sound a little over the top or like I am taking a 400 year old play set in a time that has very different values from ours too seriously and unnecessarily bringing it into modern politics. If you are making theater, if you are making art for people that touches on subjects like this, no matter how remotely, you better fucking know this shit. <laughs> I can't, I can't say it any other way. You have to know this. I, I mean the modern statistics, because while the play is from 1611, your audience is from now. You're making art for people who live now. And when it comes to domestic violence in particular, chances are that members of your audience will know this information intimately. So don't skimp on the research because it'll show. Okay. Let's invite jokes back in. So Imogen is understandably devastated. She has the dramatic Shakespeare audition speech that all of the cool girls do. And Pisanio is like, yeah, this whole situation really stinks. I am not killing you. We're actually here because it's far away from court and I brought you some men's clothes so you can travel safely. Pisanio also gives Imogen the vial of what he thinks is medicine that he got from the evil queen. Remember, he thinks it's valuable medicine. Evil queen thinks it's a slow moving poison. And only the doctor knows that it is a harmless sleeping potion. Back at Cymbeline's court, everyone has noticed that Imogen is gone. Weenie Prince Cloten bullies the servant Pisanio into telling him she is in Milford Haven in Wales. Weenie Prince Cloten then puts on some of Posthumus's clothes, I guess to show that he can look sexy in Posthumus clothes too. I know you like that other guy, but... I also can wear his clothes. And he follows her. He goes to Wales. In Wales, Imogen goes in and eats some of Mountain Man and the Mountain Lad's food. When they find her, she tells them that her name is Fidel. Get it? Fidelity truth, because she's lying about who she is. It's very clever. Okay, Shakespeare. And Mountain Man Belarius and his Mountain Lad, secretly her brothers, take her in. More politics. The Romans are preparing for war. Shakespeare continues to pretend that anyone came here for a history play. Weenie Prince Cloten finds the mountain man cave and he hides just outside ready for a fight thinking Posthumus is in there. Inside the cave some time has passed. The mountain man and the mountain lads head off to hunt and leave Imogen Fidel because she's got the flu or something. The scene also establishes that they've grown to like each other a lot. It's almost like they're siblings. Mountain man Valerius and the mountain lads exit and she 
feels like such utter shit from her flu that she takes the potent medicine. I mean poison. I mean sleeping potion. Outside the cave, Mountain Man Belarius and the Mountain Lads are surprised by Weenie Prince Cloten who attacks them. And the two Mountain Lads chase him off stage and kill him. Belarius, who remember used to be a member of the court, is like, hey dum-dums, that was the queen's son and we are now royally fucked. So they behead him to hide his identity and bury him. Look, I think he deserved better. Not much better, but a little better than being beheaded and thrown in a ditch. They go back inside the cave and find that Imogen is in a death-like sleep, and they assume that she is dead. They place her next to Weenie Prince Cloten's now headless body and take off. She promptly wakes up and sees this headless body is wearing her husband's clothes, and I know he tried to kill her, but that is pretty upsetting. That's just upsetting. I honestly feel for every actor who has ever played Imogen because Trying to say the line, Alas, where is thy head? Without making the audience laugh is not an easy task. So she's horrified, obviously, and this is how the Roman dignitary finds her. He is impressed by what he assumes is a profound display of loyalty from a young page, and he takes her to a Roman camp because war is brewing and it's all going down in Wales. Mountain Man Belarius wants to hide in the mountains to avoid the war, but the mountain lads want to fight on behalf of Britain. So for the love of his sons, he fights alongside with them. Posthumus has received word that Imogen is dead and is experiencing regret, so he goes to fight for Rome in the hopes that he will be slain in battle. Battle starts, Giacomo, now certified asshole, remember him, he is grievously injured in battle and feels so badly about what he does that he announces it to the battlefield, tells the whole story, and he is then taken prisoner by Britain. Uh, Britain wins. Posthumus is captured and set for execution. He has a post-battle vision that is almost always cut, but I think it's actually pretty cool. He sees his dead family and Jupiter, the god, not the planet, and just when he's about to be executed, an order is given that Cymbeline himself wants to see him. Also, Mountain Man Belarius and the Mountain Lads do so well in battle that Cymbeline wants to thank them personally. The Roman dignitary brings Imogen to Cymbeline because she's a Briton and he's like, look, you won, so have this kid back. The queen dies off stage, and we are told that she always hated Cymbeline and was super evil the whole time, and Cymbeline is like, damn, well, at least she was hot. And now everyone who is alive is on stage and we all take turns to explain to each other the story that the audience just watched for the last two hours. Literally just everyone explaining to everyone else what happened. It's all, but wait. How did this happen? And, oh, I know that part. It's that for 10 minutes. And just an absolute monster to stage in any sort of engaging way. This final scene is almost a little bit like a play within a play. My favorite way I've seen it is with a lot of double casting. People play more than one role. So the actors very ostentatiously had to change costumes on stage to relate a different part of the story that a different version of them knew. It's a very self-consciously theatrical scene. And I personally think it's most effective to lean into something like that. Anyway, all questions are answered, all misunderstandings are cleared up, the mountain lads now take their rightful place as heir and spare, leaving Imogen free to marry whomever she chooses. And she still chooses posthumous for some reason. And Britain is now a sovereign nation. The end! <laughs> fondness for this play. I think it has a lot of potential and I would really really like to see more people try to tackle it. It is difficult. I'm not saying it's not difficult, but I think it doesn't have a lot of like preconceived ideas. It's not like or Romeo and Juliet or Hamlet even where you have kind of like an idea of what the vibe should be. So you can do any vibe you want. <laughs> it's so odd that it just has to be chock full of strong choices. Okay, that is all. I really hope you enjoyed this play. I know it's kind of an obscure one and I hope that you all check it out sometime. And until next Thursday, have a wonderful week. That is still true. Oh, Jesus, he scared the shit out of me.